Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. Presenting sponsor, the Burrish Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm. Other sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a Cap Times member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com. Hello, I'm Paul Fanland, editor and publisher of the Capital Times, and I'd like to welcome you to this session of Cap Times Idea Fest. This is our fourth annual event, but the first we are presenting virtually. Our theme this year is 2020 Changes Everything. Given the local and regional impact of COVID-19, the resulting economic damage, and the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement, there is a lot to talk about. We think this year's lineup is our best yet. We believe IdeaFest has grown into a signature event on the Madison calendar. It's also an important showcase for the Capital Times, our locally owned and century old journalism brand. If you're not already, we hope you'll consider becoming a Cap Times member. As a member, you'll have access to special IdeaFest programs, plus benefits throughout the year. You'll also be supporting an independent and trustworthy local media source at a time when that has never been more important. Learn more at membership.captimes.com. I'd like to thank the Burrish Group at UBS, which is the presenting sponsor of IdeaFest and has been with us since the start. Andy Burrish and Jason Moss have built their asset management firm's stellar reputation by effective investing for Madisonians, but also for investing in Madison. Their generous support of IdeaFest is but one example of their community commitment. The session you're about to see is about COVID-19's effect on the Madison economy and is sponsored by the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. We're deeply grateful for them for doing that. So please enjoy this session of IdeaFest and welcome. Hello and welcome to the fourth annual Cap Times Idea Fest. It's a little different this year. My glasses keep fogging up because of this mask that I'm wearing. Um, but we continue to talk about issues that are of importance to the Madison, Wisconsin area, even though this year we're sort of doing it in a different format. Uh, joining me today to talk about the uh, Madison, Wisconsin economy, particularly what we believe it's going to look like when we get out of the other side of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, our uh, three local experts um, who were involved in the economy in various ways will we'll tap into that expertise here very soon. Uh, to my immediate right is Seth Lentz, who is the CEO of uh, the Workforce Development Board of South Central Wisconsin. Uh, he's worked in workforce development since 1998, uh, first in southwestern Wisconsin, and then as deputy director uh, in the South Central region for the last 14 years before being named CEO just uh, a couple years ago. Uh, next to Seth is Zach Brandon, who is the president of the Madison Chamber of Commerce. He's been president there since 2012. Uh, prior to that, he's held roles such as the uh, Department of, uh, working as a, a Deputy Secretary in the Department of Commerce under Governor Jim Doyle, uh, was a Madison City Council Alder for several years, um, and used to own Laundry 101, which we'll actually get into in a little bit. I'm looking forward to that. And next to Zach is uh, Sabrina Madison, a, a veteran of several Cap Times Idea Fest panels in the past. In 2016, Sabrina quit her job at Madison College to work for black women. She founded the Progress Center for Black Women one year later. Welcome to all of you this morning. Thanks, good to be here. Thank you. Seth, Thanks. we'll start with you. Um, can you just explain a little bit about what the Workforce Development Board does and what your role there is as CEO? Sure, we uh, at the Workforce Development Board, we administer some federal, state, and local um, workforce development programs, uh, primarily focused at employment and training, 
Uh, and we work with youth, um, disenfranchised, low-income low adults, as well as dislocated workers. Uh, we do a lot of programming with uh, uh, our local business community, economic development partners, education, K-12 and post-secondary, uh, and then also with um, our other federal programs, state uh, as well. Uh, and then, you know, I think our other big partner is the community-based network. Um, you know, employment training is one piece, but we definitely need all of our partners in collaboration to be able to help move the needle on some of the challenges that our workforce is facing. It's all about talent and pipeline. Okay. Now that, that population of workers who are looking for a job, maybe um, changing up their priorities in their life, that population has changed pretty drastically since February. Can you tell me a little bit about how that, just sort of that pool of people that you're working with has changed since the pandemic started? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, this pandemic was pretty interesting how it impacted our workforce, especially our dislocated worker population. You know, traditionally we've seen some other industries lead into uh, the dislocation or an economic turn. Um, and having this population that are working in the retail, the hospitality, uh, to have them really leading uh, the economic turn and being the volume of dislocated workers um, was definitely a change for us. Uh, and I think the other element that we've run into is uh, the complexity of that workforce. Many are part-time employment opportunities. They have multiple jobs within those industries. And so it was really a different workforce to try to interface with and engage with. Um, but they have a significant amount of transferable skills that I think is often um, undervalued and underestimated even by themselves. That's interesting. We'll get back to that later. I'm interested in that. Sabrina, um, can you describe for us sort of a typical day at the Progress Center um, a year ago? Oh, and, a year ago. <laughs> and how that's pivoted, how things have changed. Um, a year ago, it might have looked like we'll open up the space early in the morning and a couple black women coming in. Maybe they need to print. They want to get a cup of coffee, sit down and watch uh, some Beyonce flick on Netflix while they get some work done. Um, we may have had a woman just come in and say, hey, I have some entrepreneurial type ideas. I have no clue where to go. And we'll just sit down and try to flesh it out and you know, share the best resources. Now it looks like me doing most of that from my car remotely. I still go into the center. We recently purchased a van, so we now have this mobile resource center. So I am doing what I would have done in the physical space, literally in black women's parking lots and McDonald's parking lots, parking lots. Parking lots, parking lots, parking lots. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we were going to open up our physical space to, to allow one single youth, uh, family unit to rent it for the day. But because our numbers are kind of up now, we decided to push that back into November, December. But it really just looks like shifting where we would provide those resources at the end of the day. And the women who, who typically come to you or, or you know, are, are involved in the Progress Center, they are they're on a spectrum, right? Some yeah. are looking for their first job, some are looking for a change in life. Can you tell yeah. me a little bit about that? Yeah, we get everyone who may be from experiencing a domestic violence situation to a stay-at-home mom, to sometimes a CEO who, you know, just there are some things that she needs to discuss maybe with an employer, um, or who also may have an entrepreneurial idea. But I think we get the women who are just looking for a space where their private information won't be shared, they can feel trusted and not judged for asking for whatever help that they need. So it, 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 it's expansive. And some of the needs, um, correct me on this if I'm wrong, run from I, I need a printer, I need a, just some office um, yep. access versus that, that piece of um, you know, support and yeah, sort yeah. of camaraderie. Yep. How much of that is missing from the, the inability to access that space and how much of it are you finding that you're being able to build back up through using the van or driving yeah. around? I, th I think sometimes as simple as, hey, I need to send out an email and I just really need someone to read it over for me. And we were able to do that in a space and get the coaching through it. So now trying to do that again in a parking lot somewhere. Um, but women, come, they come to us for so many things that each day is a little bit different from the, the first. 
But right now, the most consistent need is mental health resources and money to pay bills. That's the two most consistent things. And I do see now entrepreneurial folks with entrepreneurial ideas are a bit more consistent in seeing something through. So they're actually following through on the resource. They're actually doing what like, the task necessary to get it done because folks are just trying to shift how they think about generating income for their, their households. So. All right, Zach, how's, how's your job changed since March? Well, I mean, it's, Still very much the same. When you think about what a chamber does, it's the center of a network, particularly the business network. Um, you know, we're, we started off the year focused on the region's brand, the region's economy, advocacy for our members, and then our actual member success. Nothing's really changed. We're still doing the brand promotion of this region, particularly as we're seeing demographic shifts on the coast as people are starting to think or rethink where they work, how they live, where they live. Um, the economy, we're still tracking. It's just a different type of tracking. It's much more volatile and, you know, ups and downs. Um, advocacy work continues. We've picked up a lot of the COVID advocacy work. So we're lobbying at all three levels of government, local, state, and federal, to make sure that our business needs are met within this community. But we still have challenges. You know, the local government hasn't stopped passing laws and doesn't have new regulations that we continue to have to either support or oppose. And we're very focused on our member success. I think the biggest difference is we took all of our resources and turned them outward. Normally, it's a membership organization. We have 1,250 members. Um, you, you, you belong. You join the chamber. A lot of our resources we've turned outward so that anyone can use them. We've shared um, our, our, our thought leadership with our partner organizations and just said, um, you can even just take our text and just you know, use it like a white label and just put it on your own website and don't even have to give us attribution just so that information gets out and gets out faster. When you take, I imagine you take a lot of phone calls um, heavy in your entire career. Is there something different about those phone calls that you've taken during the pandemic as opposed to before? Yeah, I mean, pre-pandemic, a lot of the phone conversations were uh, positively focused where people said, um, you know, how do I do X so that I can get to Y? Um, now there's a lot more angst and concern about you know what what can i do to react to something i have no control over whether that's the virus whether that's government action or inaction um, i think there's a lot more angst um, amongst uh, business owners business leaders about what the future holds there's a lot more uh, uncertainty and business can thrive in a culture of certainty no matter no matter what the regulation or the taxes whatever the you know business as long as it has certainty can adapt to the reality this moment in time is so uncertain that it creates, you know, it creates a, a paradigm where people are trying to gain as much access to information as possible to make decisions at a time when the, the ground literally shifts on a 24-hour basis. I was thinking about Laundry 101 um, before we started here today, and um, you know, certainly so much of the economy in Madison relies on that University of Wisconsin, even just the timetable of the school year. And I'm wondering, how do you think Laundry 101 would be doing these days? And, and are, there, are there things that you would have to do outside of the box to, to just keep it in business? Well, you know, it's a laundromat cyber cafe bar, right? And so um, the laundromat portion would have been deemed essential early on in the, you know, the beginning days of the shelter, at, shelter in place, shelter at home. Um, and so I suspect um, that, you know, the laundry would have opened. The challenge would have been rethinking uh, how people flow and interact with each other. Um, so I think from a pandemic standpoint that you, you could have still operated. I think the laundry delivery service that we had would have thrived in this moment. I think the challenge would have been um, if the university hadn't opened. So, you know, having had a, a campus economy dependent business, so it was one block off of State Street, um, during the summers, we you know, the revenue was down 70%. If when Johnson Street was redone, that was a 40% hit just because students wouldn't cross construction zone. And so the economy um, probably would have uh, negated any benefit that, or any survival that would have happened from uh, being able to be essential during the pandemic. My best guess is, is that um, Laundry 101 in a situation where campus would not have reopened would have gone out of business. Yeah. Um, I want to get to uh, something that you've encountered, some, some moment that you've uh, come across in the last six or seven months that has really defined this era um, for you. 
Um, Zach, you spoke a little bit about, um, you know, the kinds of phone calls that you're getting. Seth, are you, is there something uh, that you've encountered, maybe a person you've dealt with in the last few months that, that you've said, wow, this is really like, now it's, now it's, it's, I'm getting it. This is what this is about. Yeah, you know, I think uh, one of the experiences that I, I guess was an aha moment uh, and recognizing that this is this is something unprecedented was, again, we, we deal a lot with um, dislocations, um, company downsizings, layoffs, um, and part of our goal there is to help companies mitigate that transition as well as workers address that transition. And uh, we typically have a group that goes in and does presentations to the workers. Um, and that's where we can share with them what community resources are, how they can help to, um, you know, make that transition and capitalize on resources and opportunities. Um, and all of a sudden we couldn't go on site. So you, how do you then get that information into the hands of individuals um, and so we initially started, you know, problem solving. How do we, how do we address this? We can do it virtually. Well, the company doesn't have that capacity to do it virtually. Uh, well, we don't have recordings of this information, so we can't, well, how do we do that? So, you know, we, we did get creative and we brought in computers and set them up and we piped in our presenters to be able to kind of address that that gap there and use the technology and but i still think the aha moment for me was as we were doing all of that and we were setting up the technology we still had workers that were struggling to use the virtual interface and so even though we had done all of this prep there's this reality that they were individuals that still don't have the digital proficiency and then as we saw more people having to work remotely, working at home, and education going online, the reality that there's a segment of our workforce that still has this, has this challenge. And we're gonna have to rethink not only how do we do our, our work um, in helping people, but also preparing that, those current incumbent workers for that transition, as well as the incoming workers to be prepared to be able to pivot and learn remotely and engage remotely and use the technology. So that was definitely a moment that made me realize we've got a lot to do in a real short period of time. Yeah, wow. The, the thing that continues to come back to me is it seems like every time we identify a problem or even just a peculiar you know, situation, we, it, it just it reveals other layers. So, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you know, some of these people in our community who work with their hands, you know, they do jobs in the trades or they work in factories. They, they've chosen that life because they're not interested in sitting at a desk and messing around with a mouse and a computer. Now they're at home with kids and they're, they're the IT department for their household and this is not a job they <laughs> signed up for, right? So it's 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 step it, it just continues to step along. Now they're now they're responsible as educators for their kids as well. Are you hearing about that? That sort of homeschool environment from from folks you deal with? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that it was that homeschooling, and you know, there's some inf information that's coming out now, and we're looking at it um, as we're seeing. Uh, you know, there's. Uh, there are those that really have opted out of pursuing employment because there's so many of these other challenges about being a teacher at home now while I'm a parent, while I'm maybe trying to juggle work as well on top of that, and that there's actually some folks that are electing to, to not pursue employment right now um, because they, they need to figure that out and find a balance. Yeah. Uh, Sabrina, what about you? Has there been a moment or a particular person's story that you've connected with where you, it sort of you, caused you to sit back a little bit? Uh, yeah, there have been uh, multiple stories uh, happening. But just to go back to the technology piece, I think the moment sort of came, like I knew you, we know this is real, but just how bad things are right now is when uh, folks were getting or needing to submit documents for uh, funding from the Tenant Resource Center, we were helping folks get some of that done. 
and having folks come to, to our space to drop off documents, not having the correct documents, not necessarily understanding uh, what the form is asking them to submit. So just this understanding of technology and how to submit documents was, it was frustrating, but it also was an opportunity to say we need to back up somewhat and teach people how to use the technology and understand what's being asked because somehow they've missed this very, very important piece, which put them behind in getting funding or made they didn't ever get the funding. And then two, dealing with, um, so black women are already at a disadvantage financially. So in Dane County, the last I, I read was a, black women were around 57 cents on a dollar pre-pandemic uh, in their earnings. And it's, it's I think 60% of the jobs have come back for the white community, but that number has definitely not been the same for black women nationally. And so to deal with uh, folks who say, hey, you can go and get this food curbside, or hey, you can come get in line for this thing. Well, this black woman has three grandkids that she's raising. She's not necessarily mobile. She cannot leave her computer and her phone thing for her remote working job between eight and 4.30 because her employer is not that understanding, but she needs to feed these kids. And so I remember just dropping off grocery gift cards for her for about three weeks in a row while we organized getting other things done because she just could not, you know, leave Monday through Friday to get some things done. Um, so where it's, it, people say it's really easy to access these things, not necessarily for everyone. Sometimes the ease of an of a, of a item being delivered or offered in a community might also at the same time create barriers for someone who absolutely needs it, so. Yeah, in some ways you're acting as a personal assistant for yeah, the people yes, who really yes. need it the most, yeah. Yes. Uh, Zach, what about um, what about you? The um, you obviously deal with businesses, you know, at every level of the economy, um, very small to very large. Um, has has someone said something to you, or have you noticed something, witnessed something in, in person that's really you know hit you and and maybe altered your perspective a little bit? I think more reinforced a perspective, which is um, you know historically we've had a talking point as a chamber that says that Madison imports the world's talent and then solves the world's challenges. And it's a great talking point. And we think we could, you know, there's anecdotal stories that could have backed it up. But in the, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we have a project that we've launched called Making the Difference, which is where we went out and found stories about companies that were doing things that weren't just addressing local need, but were actually addressing global need specific to the pandemic. Um, and then we took local artists and a local tech company uh, called Underbelly and had them put it together in a visual way to tell the story visually of the difference that's being made. So you think about um, early on, we heard that um, the swabs in the nasal tests were, oh, there was a shortage of them nationally. And then Teal Plastics and Baraboo heard the story and ramped up production and made 3 million swabs in you know, a very quick period of time and got the country, got the entire country back up to speed again. Um, you know, Epic got 200 plus hospitals online immediately so that they could do telehealth and has launched a data project so that people can look at the, look at their, uh, the, the trend lines and the data that Epic has built into their system so they can see what's going on. The Badger Face Shield, which is a fantastic story that was, you know, developed right here as a collaboration between two companies in the university. Um, Catalans doing trials for uh, one of the vaccines. And so all that's occurring within Madison. And so it just reinforces to me the role that Madison plays in the global economy and in the global problem solving um, that is more than just a talking point that it's actually proved out during the pandemic. Great. Um, Seth, I'm wondering if um, you have thoughts about, you know, when it comes to coming out of this on the other side um, and, you know, uh, returning to normal is such a loaded term at this point, but getting to a place where, you know, uh, people are getting job, looking for jobs, finding jobs, uh, you know, moving up in their jobs, earning more. Do you think there's something about Madison or Wisconsin that, that makes it particularly resilient or uh, that makes conditions around here a little bit easier to bounce back? Well, I think, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out because I do think that, uh, you know, we've, we have some attributes that um, as a community we've continued to invest in. And that is, you know, trying to diversify our talent pipeline, address some of the disparity and achievement issues that were, were prevalent, you know, uh, before. 
um, and we're going to continue to work on those. And so I do think that uh, we've continued as a community to focus on how do we become more proactive on um, talent development. Uh, we're doing more with our, our K-12 system. We're doing more with our, uh, to be proactive on talent development um, uh, with folks with barriers and disabilities. Uh, we're doing, you know, more things with uh, re-entry populations to try to be more proactive on that talent development. So um, not that those have stopped during this time period, um, but I think that we're starting to see like those were some of the strategies that helped our region um, be competitive. Um, and But I think that we have kind of this fabric um, of our community that that's what we do. And I think that oftentimes we underestimate that uh, because we're used to seeing a lot of it. Um, and, you know, Zach, we've been uh, on some of our, you know, when companies are looking to locate and we'll be talking about it. And it's not that we need to prop something new up. A lot of these relationships and networks exist already, which sets us apart. But I think that sometimes we we fail to acknowledge, like we're ahead in some areas. We still got a lot of work to do and all things are not equal and accessible. Um, and I think that that's one of the other elements that the pandemic has shown a light on and, and we'll continue to have to pursue those. When you look, I, I know, you know, depending on which sector you talk to, um, it seems like most people all the time complain about uh, whether the workforce here is is poised to, to do the kinds of jobs that they want to do at any given time. Um, you know, and trades are, are one of those uh, where they talk about how, well, the you know, we've de-emphasized that education. It seems like that education has been coming back. Maybe that's just anecdotal. Is that, um, are there challenges on that? Is that, or is that kind of education able to, you know, continue along during the pandemic? Uh, so a lot of that um, has, uh, especially like in the construction yeah. and some of the building trades, um, has a, a foundation of utilizing apprenticeship as a method of workforce development. And I think that that strategy is a, a very wise strategy because you're working and learning and you're applying those skills kind of as you go along. Um, they've continued, the trades have definitely continued. But now we're actually seeing the utilization of apprenticeship expand into some of the other industries um, as a viable pipeline development strategy. Um, but specifically in regards to the trades, there's been uh, the designation of pre-apprenticeship trainings. And some of those, again, are very manual hands-on trainings. And so they had to do some rebranding and rethinking and redesigning but they've continued on and are, and are starting back up now in our area. So I think that we're gonna to continue to see that be a viable um, you know, industry for us. I don't necessarily see construction, sure. if you will, ceasing, um, but some of those activities are definitely coming back online. Great. Um, Sabrina, you mentioned before the um, sort of the pay disparities, the mm -hmm. uh, earnings disparities, and uh, you know, it's, um, we, we should recognize that it, when Madison has succeeded traditionally and historically, it has not always brought everyone along in that in those successes. Um, if if you were hearing, if if you were speaking to local leaders, business owners, um, CEOs, and elected leaders, uh, what might you tell them to say that uh, you know if we, if if we do experience this recovery, what needs to happen so that everyone will be brought along with it? I guess one, put down the sort of plan into the optics of success versus actual success, and then to set the standards high for what success looks like for the black community and for anyone of color working for a company. But from my day-to-day -day experience, this city uh, definitely, you know, cheers on equity and diversity or whatever. There's always a probably a new committee being formed as we record this right now about diversity and equity. But I think oftentimes, um, folks spend a lot of time talking and never get to the sort of action plan that, have, you know, that might have come out of this diversity or community work or committee work. Get there. Just go back to what the action plan or the, the, the plan said to do. Do that. It's already there. I don't want you to create anything new. 
do what was already said to be, needed to be done, but more importantly, set a high bar. I think overall, um, unless you're employing your your work group is like 50 percent folks of color, this city has set a very low bar for what diversity and equity actually looks like, and it has not held itself to a high standard of what that can be. It's sort of like check mark hired a black person, check mark, hired someone from the native community, check mark, added this person to a committee with no real value, no real investment and very low standards. So my, my ask would simply be set high standards for the company, uh -huh. for the CEO, for the board, most definitely, but set high standards for what it looks like for career leader, like for leadership development within an organization. One of the reasons why I quit the college to go and work for black women specifically is because I, as a black woman, got tired of being the only black woman in talks that I was booked for here. I would travel the country and I would walk into spaces that were very diverse. And every time I would ask these the, like white women in my talks here, where do you work? They worked at some of the top companies who I knew employed black women, but those black women weren't in these leadership development talks. So that to me says that the companies that are sending their women, especially to leadership development um, training, had a very low bar for the black women who worked for them. Fantastic, that's great. Um, we're, we need to take a break right now uh, to thank some of our sponsors for IdeaFest. And when we come back, we'll talk to Zach about that issue, um, along with uh, learning a little bit about what government might be able to do uh, to help out with this recovery. We'll be right back. Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. Presenting sponsor, the Burris Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm. Other sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com. WKOW Channel 27 and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a Cap Times member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com. Welcome back. Uh, we left our discussion off with Sabrina Madison talking about uh, holding uh, leaders and companies in our, in our city uh, responsible for, for bringing along all populations and communities in whatever recovery would look like. Zach, in, in your role uh, working with businesses and actually as a liaison between several different communities, um, how can we do that? How can we make sure that when assuming the tide lifts again, that that all the boats come along with it to use sort of a hackneyed cliche? I mean, I think Sabrina's comments is right, which is there's been a lot of talk um, and we haven't produced as much action from that talk and that more talk isn't necessarily what this community needs. I, there's a, actually it was in the Cap Times months ago, um, was when uh, John Nolan was shut down for a dance party and the mayor came to speak and a young leader in the audience uh, yelled out, um, don't come here telling me, I'm paraphrasing, but don't come here telling me what you're gonna do, tell me what you've done. I think that's the accountability that Madison has with one caveat, which is we have not done a good job with data um, companies have done a good job inside the four corners of their business of trying to keep track. Um, but we don't know as a community if we're really making progress. There's the anecdotal feeling, right? There's the, there's the experiential feeling, the lived experience that says, like, my life isn't changing. Um, but the question is, um, how do we track that and how do we hold ourselves accountable for that? I do think that the, the question is the right question because the data says that coming out of the recovery, um, things look bright for Madison. And there's multiple studies out right now that show that Madison could be one of the bright spots for recovery. There's an asterisk on that with two pieces, and one of that is equity and inclusion. There's um, what recovers in our economy and what people are holding us up as a potential to be this bright spot is 
the advanced economy. It's the innovation economy. It's the tech economy. And what we've seen historically across the board on the coast, so we've got decades of experience of watching the coasts grow a tech community. We see actually inequity grow in those communities. And so it's it, the, the, the data says one very positive thing about where we're headed, but we know what happens when that, when that occurs. It creates additional um, disparities. And then so it's kind of shame on us if we know that going in, yet we do nothing to actually address it. The other piece is, is that if in the process of getting to recovery, we destroy our independent, local, small business, so what makes us special, what makes up the fabric of this community, um, and what sets us apart as a place, if that's destroyed in the process, then I don't think we can ever really live up to what people say we will. And so I think there's a difference of the, what the data tells us and what reality will dictate to us. And I think if we are not focused on making sure that we say we deliver on what we said we would go, what we would do particularly around diversity inclusion equity and justice and uh, making sure that we protect local small businesses um, if we don't do those two things i don't think the recovery is guaranteed traditionally these the kinds of successes that you're talking about are not measured in you know uh, spreadsheets uh, annual uh, reports um, you know s stock prices you know whatever the traditional metrics of business success are there examples locally? Are there examples elsewhere around the country that you think uh, people should adopt so that we do hold ourselves accountable to data that, that's measurable and chartable? I think Milwaukee's, um, Milwaukee's done something that we hope to replicate um, and then use it as the ability to benchmark against each other is there's a lot of companies that are talking about uh, diversity, inclusion, equity work. Um, there are a subset of those that are doing good work I think Sabrina's statement is right, which is, you know, show me how it's moving the needle, right? Show me how the, the rooms that she walks into to, as a thought leader tell me how the audience is different. Let me see the change, not just hear about the change. Um, what we don't have, though, is uh, ability to collect data across the board to understand how is this moving in the entire economy. It's not just a couple of uh, spotlights. Mm -hmm. And Milwaukee is doing a, a, a project um, that um, is designed to make Milwaukee a, a place of choice for, uh, for the, a workforce of color. And they've gotten hundreds of companies to agree to share their data. They'll aggregate it, anonymize it, and use it to benchmark against. Um, I think that's a project that Madison, and one that we intend to push forward with CEOs, um, to be able to say, we're not in any. We're not in the. We're not going to get in anybody else's space. To Sabrina's point, there's lots of programs. People need to start executing on the programs. But how do we know if we're actually making a difference? How do we actually know if we're moving the needle? And then who's holding us accountable as a community if we aren't actually making a difference? And so I think that um, it's right down the road. Right, Milwaukee, I think, is showing us that data can be part of the solution. That's that's interesting. We'll pay attention to that for sure. Um, you mentioned earlier um, the small business aspect of this, and certainly I, there's small business in my household um, that has, uh, you know, da daily we look at the future and what this is all going to mean for us. I want to use that as an example of asking the question about uh, where is government in this? Um, is, has it been successful? Um, what does it need to be doing going forward at any level, from city council all the way up to Washington, um, to ensure that those small businesses can recover as well. And what we learned early on in the pandemic is it, it was gonna necessitate equilibrium, that you had to be able to balance public health, which was certainly tantamount, which was certainly number one starting off, and remains in the forefront of everybody's thinking, even today as we see increases um, at the national and state level. The, uh, the other part of that, though, is balancing the economy. And, and a destroyed or um, depressed economy has public health consequences. So those, those cannot be separated from each other. They are, they are linked to each other. And then the third is confidence. And that confidence is employee confidence, that people will feel comfortable going to work. Consumer confidence, that consumers will say, I, I, want, I feel comfortable enough to go into your business. And then the business investment confidence, that people will continue to invest in their business you know, I think that um, some levels of government have done a good job of trying to balance those. I think I would have, if you had started January 1, 2020 and said to me, 
the federal government will get its act together and put trillions of dollars into the, into the economy in order to help businesses find relief, I would have said, no way. And if you told me they would do that before state and local government would do it, I'd say absolutely impossible. And yet the dysfunctional federal government figured out a way to put resources out, and whether it's PPP loans or the EIDL grants. Um, you know, I think that the state has been a, just a colossal disappointment across the board, that they, everything they've done is nibbled around the edges or it's just been inaction and finger pointing. And at the local level, I think it's hamstrung by just resources. There's just not that much available, but it's been diffused. It hasn't been laser focused. It hasn't said like, let's target, um, you know, the hardest hit businesses. Let's target the businesses that are um, the ones that are likely to fall off the, the cliff. And so um, I, business and government need to maintain this partnership, but we are headed into a point where the federal dollars have run out. The temperature is changing, we all feel it. Winter is coming, and yet we find ourselves no closer to an understanding of what's next for relief and reopening coming from the federal government, and that's gonna be problematic for all of us. Seth, from your perspective, um, <clears throat> what would you like to see from uh, local, state, federal government um, to ensure that this, um, the recovery is sped along, maybe that uh, you know we're able to work competently before the recovery comes. If I can actually connect, it, hopefully, Please, uh, yeah. a couple of those elements, I do think that the data is really important for us to, to look at. Data, some data that we've been looking at exists, which is also taking a look at, uh, we've actually seen a labor force contraction during this period of time. So I mentioned earlier how some people are opting out. Some people opted to retire. Um, but when we look at the data of the labor force, so those that are employed and those that are unemployed versus and, and removing those that just aren't looking for work, we're seeing actually in, in the data a contraction of the workforce. Now, one, my question to the state was, and their economic uh, folks was, wait a minute, what's going on here? Where is the contraction and who is the contract? Like, what are we seeing there? Um, and then when I couple that with some of the other uh, information that's been coming out in regards to uh, that the women may be part of this contraction, that they're stepping back from engaging in the labor force, I think that that's concerning because we've made strides and we know the contribution and to step, if we end up losing a significant contingency of the, the female population from our labor force, then I think that we've just compounded a whole nother problem. So I, what I'd like to see is really understand that data and then if we're gonna make some investments, let's again make those investments to make sure that we don't lose a significant portion of our labor force that's pretty critical um, and have to then recapture that ground. Um, and if we're gonna make some investments, let's make the investments to help stabilize whatever is the contributing factor that is forcing them to leave mm -hmm. um, or elect to not maintain their engagement, as well as then how do we, how do we bring in um, those others that maybe haven't engaged or how do we step them up? Do you have any insight into why that might be? Is it is it just straight up health safety concerns about being out in the world during the pandemic? Is it related to this education piece that we talked about earlier? Yeah, I, I wish I had some of those answers. And that's some of the data that I'm really hoping that we can dig into to better understand it. Because we're looking at least in the Dane or the Madison uh, data, it's a contraction of about 10,000 people. That's wow. significant, yeah. you know, right now. Um, and uh, so if, if we can get our hands around what that is and who that is, then I think we can get better position. But unfortunately right now, I, I, I don't have the data uh -huh. or, or the information behind it. Sabrina, from your perspective, what can our uh, elected leaders, government, um, if anything, um, what can they be doing to help uh, with the recovery, particularly from your perspective, working with black women? A, a totally different perspective, but back to, I just want to go back to the business community. And I think that, yes, we're in a pandemic. When we talk about recovery, I also think about recovery of like my black life and other folks' black lives. And I think that the business community and the local government is doing a disservice to itself 
by not necessarily being big partners in the Black Lives Matter movement. Every, most, at least 10, 20 times since um, we had, like, the protest downtown and businesses were broken into or whatever, I kept asking myself, what would downtown look like now had, after the killing of George Floyd, businesses decided we're going to close our business for, I don't know, a couple days, a week, whatever, and we're going to ask our employees to get out here and just participate because we believe that Black Lives Matter. I just keep asking myself, what would matter to look like had the business community overall, we don't need like signs, we don't need flags, I don't need like a little banner on your website. I needed your physical body and the power behind like your board and your membership and your employees to be out there. So when I think about recovery, I think about both happening at the same time. How do we recover a community so my son walks down State Street or walks down any street in Madison and I feel safe and he feels safe and we can still, you know, create and generate income so we have a, a pretty, you know, comfortable way of life, you know, day to day. So that's how I think about recovery. Um, my black life matters. The government says it's mad, it matters. The business community uh, takes a very, like, intentional effort to make it matters and to say it matters. Um, and we just sort of, like, recovered, it, recovered this together because you... I, I don't... I think governments, period, lo across the country, but especially locally, I just feel like we're missing an opportunity to sort of um, recover both, to make sure that both feels, both feel welcome after we get out of this pandemic. So we're at 2021, thank, hopefully it's not as long as 2022. And I come out of this and I feel very differently living in Madison as a black woman. And I feel very differently um, about my life and my ability to generate income for my family. You know, like I just, yeah. I want both to recover strong. This, uh, we've sort of, touched around the edges of this idea that what we're in right now represents a big reset button, or it should, or it could. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're getting at that a little bit. Boy, resetting the button means not just, you know, in the areas of public health and, and um, you know, economic development, but social development, speaking about justice, issues like that. What would you like to see from your elected leaders? Right now, it seems like much of what we hear are mask mandates. You know, mm -hmm. should we force people to wear masks or should we let them make their own decisions? Where should that discussion be right now, do you think? I think the, the discussion around justice should just be part of every discussion. I just remember being on a committee and we were, you know, we were, we were coming up with some strategic plans and it just seemed like everybody wanted to put the strategic plan or the, the one that sort of get at equity right at the bottom. I was like, why isn't it just part of everything? You know, I, I just, it didn't make sense to me. And I feel like that's where we're at. We try to separate these discussions when they go hand in hand. You know, so I, I just think that if we're talking about mask mandates, we also talking about there's some equity issues even around getting a mask, having a mask. You know, if I go to a place versus my son walking into a store with a mask on, there may be a very different, you know, interaction versus yeah. a white man walking in with a mask. They're, you know, they all go together. They should not be separated out. And I think the business community especially, because I was very, I was, as someone who, who when I moved here, I absolutely loved Walk Stake and Walking State Street. I, it was like the, one of the highlights of my first couple of years living here. And that changed over time to, uh, based on how my son's interaction started happening on State Street. It just became a, a very like standoffish place to both of us. And then I started hearing after the, the, the protest that there were businesses of color down there. And I was like, where? You know, I've never, heard, I've never heard from them. So I was very, very, very disappointed in how some businesses sort of reacted to the protests while in the midst of a pandemic, like we're not in a pandemic too. I wanted them to be a bit more caring. And if you identify as a, a business owner of color, then I need you to be in a business owner of color discussion when I am in it, you know, advocating for certain things. So I, I'm, I've just been disappointed, but... I am on, I, I guess I'm feeling a bit better because we've been in some really good discussions with businesses downtown. Um, so I do feel positive about where we're going, but the bar is still, in my opinion, set very low for where we're going. Sort of a <clears throat> quiet theme that I've heard emerge over the past couple months is, you know, sort of living with this discomfort, mm -hmm. realizing, um, you know, people from my perspective who now are suddenly faced with, 
you, you don't have access to this. These, these things that you've taken for granted now for, for many years now you don't have access mm -hmm. to. You're not allowed in these spaces. You can't go into this restaurant and, and you know, just treat it like it's your own. Mm -hmm. And this conversation that our community, I think, is having quietly maybe should have more loudly of living with that, that level of discomfort allowing it to inform your empathy mm -hmm. and then changing your attitude and yeah. your actions going forward. Um, Seth, one of the big pieces of news that we've learned in the last month is that um, such a, a small percentage of people seeking unemployment assistance um, were served by the state government, could even get through um, you know, on a phone call. That must affect people's uh, confidence, not just in government and, you know, and unemployment, but in just whether the system is working for them. Um, does that affect that uh, that workforce then when when we sort of need them to go back to work? Are they as energized as they need to be? And do things need to happen to to regain that confidence? Oh, I, I mean, I absolutely think so. You know, I think that, uh, you know, and even in workforce development, uh, we get a lot of calls because our names are pretty close. Yeah. Um, so we got a lot of calls and we've, you know, we've had to try to handle as many calls. And, you know, what we continued to see was People just, I mean, they want some live body and they want some response, you know, and it is still a customer service, you know, um, engagement to some, to some extent. Um, and I think that one of the challenges that we also ran into was our job centers, which are one of our main hubs for delivery, have also been closed because of the public interface and, and that sort of thing. So I definitely think that there's been um, a challenge in public perception and trust and accessibility questions. Um, and I think that that's gonna be a challenge that we've got to, you know, as a workforce development system, we've got to acknowledge and we've got to continue to strive towards improving it. Um, but I think that uh, we also have to overcome um, the access to the information and part of that has been us really trying to be innovative about how do we get information out to people in new ways and new fashions. And that's gonna, um, that's gonna continue to be a challenge and uh, we have to engage you know, as many people as possible to learn what strategies are working, what are the best opportunities, where do we need to be. Um, and it's again, it's forcing us to be in completely different places at different times. Um, and that's going to really force uh, the, the collaborative, if you will, all of the partners that are in that workforce system to, to change and collaborate on strategies, but also maybe invest differently in the, with the resources that we have. If we think about um, sitting in this room maybe a year from now, um, do you have predictions, thoughts about that? What, what do we think that might look like? Um, and maybe even more specifically, um, in order to feel good and successful about the recovery a year from now, what are one or two things that need to happen? I think that uh, we're going to need to continue to ramp up some of our, um, our experiences that we've gotten in regards to um, incumbent worker training strategies um, and how to increase the accessibility. And I think companies are also going to play a big role in that because I don't think that the, the skilling up and the advancing of workforce is gonna happen solely on individual's time. Um, I think that it's gonna be a blending between uh, companies acknowledging and investing not only in the cost of the training and supporting that, but also the time. Because I think people are really getting stressed out with balancing some of these, some of these efforts. But I think it's also gonna be this new um, blended delivery strategy of education and, and talent development um, that I think this environment has propelled us maybe faster than uh, we originally or we would have um, pursued them. But I think that that's going to be one of the biggest challenges um, as our education is getting, our education systems are improving the stackability of credentials and that continues to build up. Um, we're getting earlier into the K-12 system to be able to dual credit those things and build those skills and experiences. I also think the other element that I'm, I'm really hoping continues to grow is um, the work-based learning opportunities for our youth. 
Um, you know, they don't know what they don't know. And we've got to continue to provide opportunities for them to see and experience things and recognize, um, you know, our youth are, are having to make some decisions really early in their life. And some of them are very um, uh, permanent decisions are per important. And we kind of fail to sometimes remember their kids uh, and they need these experiences to learn and make mistakes and that's okay. Um, those are just lessons, you know, if you repeat it, then maybe it's a mistake, but uh, capitalize on those lessons and opportunities. But, you know, all of our industries, they might not recognize that opportunity. And I'm really hoping that we continue to grow those opportunities as much as possible. Sabrina, where would you uh, like to see, what would you like to see happen um, for us to be able to sit, sit around even six months from now and say, okay, this is, this is going well, the, we are actually recovering. Oh, wow, a standards of success report would be a start. Yeah. Uh, I would love to see like where, I think Zach was talking about earlier, like, I would love to see like actual real numbers, like actually what's happening within a company, within an organization and a community. Um, but one thing um, I think sort of almost like a wish list that I would love to be at is that the business community and folks working in housing have formed some sort of stable, and more, um, I don't know, just bigger partnership because no matter how many, you know, folks you get into an employment opportunity, they can, st most of them still cannot afford uh, housing or to buy a house. So even if someone is somewhere maybe 17 to $19 an hour, they're still very much struggling, especially as a black woman in Madison, you're still struggling to afford a two bedroom apartment, your utilities, groceries, and gas. So in six months, because those two, housing and employment, are very big, you know, parts of our day to day, I would love to see a bigger partnership between folks working in housing and folks who have jobs because they job, folks with uh, job opportunities need folks to work at those jobs and those folks need somewhere to live and be comfortable. So for instance, sometimes we negotiate conversation between an employer and an employee on an advancement because the person is about to lose housing but they are employed. So some of our biggest employers, their employees are coming to us for help to pay their rent. So it's just, it's, I, I don't know what's happening between the two, but in six months, can y'all partner, please? Start today. You, um, as you <laughs> mentioned before, you have this sweet van now. Are there other plans or other um, uh, things that you're optimistic about yep. in particular at the center that you're looking to roll out? Yeah, I mean, like, I'm gonna take um, Zach's idea with the laundry. We were already talking about doing laundry days, you know, cause we've spent maybe a thousand dollars in helping folks wash their clothes, especially early on in the pandemic. But I think we're gonna pop up at Laundry Mats, planned of course, and offer some cafe, you know, coffee and tea from the van. Because what folks also are missing, um, that's really a little bit heartbreaking for me is the social, just socializing. So I remember dropping off coloring books a couple of days ago, black women were running up to the van for a coloring book and complete joy. Um, so we'll be able to just get out, just get out to folks a lot better and not forcing them to come to us, you know, when we're open to our business hours. So I'm just looking for honestly, just being able to provide some social, like some joy right at your doorstep. We'll, uh, we'll leave it with you, Zach. What, um, what predictions do you have um, and what expectations do you have for the next six to 12 months? I think what you've heard from the conversation is um, six months ago, I would have said, if you'd asked me a similar question, I would have said that Seth is in the uh, business of supply of talent. The, the business community is in the business of demand and Sabrina fills in the gaps that naturally occur because there's going to be gaps in there and she's the filler or the mortar that moves in and says, this part's not talking to this part. I need to close the gap between those two. I think what you're hearing today is, is that we're all talent all of a sudden, right? That we're all focused on all pieces of talent. Sabrina's talking about going in, negotiating directly with, with the businesses and employers to, to, uh, to help uh, black women. Seth's talking about not just looking at one side of the coin, but with the data telling about where it's headed for the future. We're starting to, to get into talent recruitment and data tracking around what does talent look like. And so I, I think that six months from now, that the, that the national studies, whether it's Brookings, whether it's Moody's, uh, and whether it's Bloomberg, which all have Madison as one of the first places um, to accelerate into and out of the recovery, um, will be correct. I think what the next six months will dictate to us is the, uh, is the intentionality that we all talk about or the, the feel-good statements that we all make as a community. 
will those be translated into action? Will government do, you know, do more than just say that it cares about these things? Will business find ways to step into um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, right? And, and thinking about what is their role in pushing that forward and doing it in a, a real and meaningful way. If we can all do what Sabrina's been trying to do with the center is be a nexus of the network, of putting everything together. What if we were all playing that role? She'd still have her role, um, and certainly she's on the street doing the work. Um, but what if we all had that role, or we saw ourselves as part of that nexus of making sure everything fit together and that there weren't gaps and that there weren't disparities? Um, if we commit ourselves to that, which uh, you've heard both Sabrina and Seth say are important pieces of their work, if we as a community, a business community, and a government can commit ourselves to that, I think we will live up to the potential, which is that this could become the next great place in America for everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Seth, Zach, Sabrina. Uh, fantastic conversation about really important issues. I hope to be able to uh, see you all without masks sometime <laughs> in, the, in the not too distant future. I hope you all stay healthy uh, between now and then. Thank you very much for joining us at IdeaFest. I hope to see all you very soon without masks and uh, in a healthy conversation where we can all share the same space as well. Enjoy the rest of Idea Fest, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. Presenting sponsor, the Burris Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm. Other sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a CapTimes member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com.